Hallelujah. Come on and clap your hands before the Lord. Amen. It's good to be before you this morning, and we've got a journey to go on this morning. I'm so excited. Can you take me back to um, in your presence real quick, and I want to go to the bridge in that. Um, but I, as you all were singing that, um, there, it, it just, I was like, man, this is a perfect introduction to the sermon for today. So, um, but I just praise God for the opportunity this morning. And so uh, I want to sing that line one more time just in the bridge because it really has a lot to do with what God has given me for today. And so um, I want to invite you just to stand just, uh, just briefly. If you don't want to stand, that's fine. But if you can stand, you know, let us worship the Lord together. Hallelujah. The song says, you will be... You will be our guide to the end, to the end. The Lord, the Lord is with me. He will not forsake me. You will be to the end. The Lord is with me. He will not forsake me. I know it means something to somebody. You will be. To the end. The Lord is with me. He will not forsake me. Your love is everlasting. Here we go. And your love is everlasting. Your kindness never ends. God, you'll never leave me. Your presence goes before us. Your glory has no end. God, you'll never leave me. Raise your hands before the Lord. Father, we make these declarations today, Lord God, because we do trust in your presence. We trust in who you are, oh God. Father, we believe you, Lord God, and we believe your spirit, oh God. Father, we pray, Lord God, as the word is spoken, Lord God, that our hearts would be encouraged, oh God. Father, may we stand even stronger today, Father. Father, we thank you, Lord God. Speak through me today, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Let every heart say amen and amen. You all may be seated in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Diane and the rest of the band. Um, there's been so much that has gone on this week, and, and uh, I, I have to commend our intercessory team that has been praying for me and praying with me, and th those of you that have been praying as well. This week has just been a very tough week. It has been a very tough week, and um, so many different storms from the global storms all the way to just very personal storms have just taken me on a ride this week. And it's just like, okay, God, you, you, you're speaking something, you're ministering something, you, you're wanting me to understand something, all because of these different things that have been going on. But these things are, are not anything that's different than the norm. This stuff is, is life. It's life's issues. And these storms, they rise up and they fall and then they rise up and they fall again. And how are we to stand? How are we to stand? You all know of the global atrocities that have happened, you know, as far as Israel and Hamas and, and so much just kicked off. And it was just like, God, what is going on? And then you have the things that happened in Afghanistan, Afghanistan the earthquake. In the same day, it's like there's a huge earthquake in Afghanistan. Many people die. And so I don't know about you, but automatically I'm going searching in the word. What is, I'm like, God, okay, where are we in the timeline? Because this stuff is a little bit crazy right now. It's amped up. And it's horrible. It's horrific what has happened. God, where are we? Okay? And, and, and where and how are we to stand? Especially for me as a spiritual leader, what is the direction that we need to be taking the church in the midst of all the craziness that's going on? Because it's crazy. But God began to really speak, and I praise God for uh, Kevin Randall. On the call, he, he basically you know, gave us a four-point sermon um, dealing with discover, rediscover, rediscover, rediscover. And it really blessed my heart as he went through these four different points. And I'm not going to preach a sermon, but there was one point that I felt like needed to be added to that and how we need to rediscover hope. 
Because many of the situations that we go through, it starts to tear apart our hope. And so when we, when we come to Christ, he is our hope. But for whatever reason, what we just sang is he will be our guide to the end. For whatever reason, whenever these storms come, it takes us off the guide. And we start getting over to the side and looking at other things. And so God has brought me to this scripture, uh, and, and this message is entitled, um, Actively Waiting. Hallelujah. Go to Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. We're going to be on a real great journey with this, and I pray that you will receive um, as God has given it to me. So this is Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. Praise God. Let's read together. Um, For God, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and in a godly manner in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good deeds. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, do we have that up? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. We want to go ahead and get that scripture up so because we're going to be working through this. And so God has really called us into this place where we are stable in our faith. That there's this place that we are not shifted from. That there is something that happens in our waiting. That we are active in our waiting. Waiting for what? God says that he is soon to return. Hallelujah. And so when I look at uh, Titus chapter 2 verse number uh, 13, it says, Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus. There is something we are supposed to be looking for. Hallelujah. And what catches us off guard when stuff happens is that we weren't looking in the first place. Do you hear what I'm saying? So there, like, you can have a vacation that you've planned, and it's like there's a destiny of the vacation. And, and I'm looking forward to the vacation. I'm looking forward. We made plans and everything. And all of a sudden, on the side, you've got different things that have happened that have kind of like, you know, messed you up a little bit. But there's a goal in mind. It's like, no, we're still going on this vacation. I don't care what happened, we're still going on this vacation. However, when it comes to the people of God, when stuff happens around the world, we lose sight of where we're supposed to be going. It's like, God, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's going on. We get all anxious. We don't know what's going on. We're getting confused. We're just like, we start trying to hold on to different things, and we've lost sight of the goal. And here in verse 13, he's saying that we're looking for the blessed hope. I don't know about you, but my life was in such a way that there was no hope. And then when I came to Jesus, all of a sudden he became my hope. So this says we need to be looking for the blessed hope. So I need to be constantly looking in the way of Jesus. Hallelujah. When I start to look at the other things, it's just like Peter. Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and all of a sudden he started to sink. And I don't know about you, sometimes the situations we go through, especially through this week, the propensity for me to sink was very much there. The, the heaviness of all the issues, uh, Stephen, the heaviness of every single issue has a tendency to be some weights that will pull you down. And before you know it, instead of being the herald of, yes, Christ is good, yes, he is wonderful, yes, he is powerful, you find yourself saying, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't have the answer. I can't fit. I, I, you start doubting. And the weights begin to pull you down. So a question being going to stir in me, who are you looking at? Who are you looking at? Because if you're looking at the circumstances, you're going to sink. But if I keep my eyes on Jesus, he has never failed me yet. And as a matter of fact, we've been through this before. 
You can look over your life and see how you've been through storm after storm, and the one who you put your trust in, he has remained faithful. So there's no reason to doubt him even now. Hallelujah. So the posture for every believer has to be a posture of watching. Hallelujah. We need to be watching. If there's an active position, an active posture, we need to be actively watching. I need to be looking for him. Hallelujah. Part of that verse says, and, and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, if I'm going to be watching, I'm watching for the promise that he has made. He said he is going to return. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, with all the signs that were going on, I'm like, God, is this it? What's going on? Because this looks really bad. So am I getting caught up in the news or am I going to put my eyes on Jesus? Because it's like any day. At least that's how it feels. The wars and rumors of wars. And it's like, okay, Jesus. If things are not right, you better get it right. There's an there's old song, get right, church, and let's go home. Oh, get right, and let's go home. Get right, church, get right, church, get right, church, and let's go home. That's all to the song. That's all, that's all, to, that's all you need. That's right. We don't need, we don't need two verses, yep, about the trees and the rainbows and Yep, I hear you, Pastor Jason. The signs are there. Get right, church. He is soon to come. And I think that we get so comfortable in this relation, in this, do we call it a relationship? We get so comfortable in in what we're doing. I'll say that. We get comfortable in what we're doing that we lose sight that there's a goal. He is coming again. He has made the promise Hallelujah. If you look at John chapter 14, verse 1 through 3, he said to the disciples, he said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. We've given up all this stuff to be with him. Hallelujah. And, and, and we don't have the fulfillment of the promise in this life right now, which means he's given me his Holy Spirit to let me know that there's something coming. He's given me his Holy Spirit so that I can believe on what is to come, a new body, a new life, no more sickness, no more pain. I'm going to be with him forever. Hallelujah. If you satisfied with this life, then guess what? You're going to miss him. Hallelujah. I know I'm not satisfied. I got pains in my knees. It's, it's, no. Jesus, come get me. But in all seriousness, we have to be in a posture where we're looking for Jesus. And if we're spending so much time trying to build all these other things, it's just going to be like the days of Noah. Days of Noah, Noah was building the ark, and the people were looking at him like, what are you doing? We ain't have rain. We ain't even seen rain. And, and, and Noah was just like, but it's going to rain. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to rain because that's what my God said. And because I believe what my God said, I'm making preparation because it's going to rain. You're welcome to join me. Hallelujah. But it is is going to rain but if we caught up in our own stuff we're gonna miss it there's a promise he has made a promise he said believe in me touch your neighbor and say believe in him believe in him Hallelujah. First Thessalonians, I want you to go there, chapter 4. First Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. Check this out. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. 
Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from the graves. Verse 17, then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. Hallelujah. Now, this was, a, this was an encouragement to the Thessalonians because they were concerned what happens with those believers who have died. And so the Apostle Paul sends them this letter to encourage them that they are going to rise first. But here's the thing that I'm looking at. I'm looking at what is the next prophetic event that we're supposed to be looking forward to. And it is the rapture of the church. It is the rapture of the church. This is the next big thing. I was thinking, you know, and Pastor Jason had to correct me. You don't even realize how you corrected me this week. You don't realize how God used you. But as soon as you said what you said to me on Tuesday, I went on a journey. And this journey was a correct journey. We are not talking about enough of the return of Jesus. The Bible says here in verse 18 that we are to speak these words to one another. He is soon to return. See, if you don't talk about it, you don't have an appetite for it. If you don't talk about it, it is not going to be in your view. If you don't talk about it, there's no goal that we're reaching towards. Hallelujah. So we don't know where we're going. So all this stuff is going on and we're just like, I don't know. I don't know what's happening. I don't know. Jesus is coming back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what we believe. This is what we stand on, that Jesus has made a promise. If I go, I'm coming again to receive you unto myself. What are the signs? Here are the signs. He says it. The Lord will appear in heaven. So I need to be looking up. The Lord will appear in heaven. He will give a commanding shout. I I was sitting in my car yesterday. I'm like, you know, and I was bumping my music. And I was thinking. Gosh, will I hear the shout above my music? It's just playing with me, you know, because I'm bumping. And it's loud and it's good. But would I hear the shout above my music? I was just wondering. That's just one of them things that make you go, hmm. The trumpet call of God. Would I hear the trumpet? If I'm sleeping in my bed, I'm like, man, are we going to hear the trumpet? Is it going to be that loud that even in the shower... When the water is going past your ears, are you going to hear the trumpet blast? Just, just, just wonder. The believers will rise out of the ground. That's going to be something. Those who are dead in Christ, they're going to rise up first. That's going to be powerful. You'll be reunited with those that have passed. Hallelujah. You know you missed them. But the promise that we have, we're a people of hope. We're going to see them again all because of Jesus. We're going to see them again because of the promise that has been made. Hallelujah. But be even beyond our reuniting, we are going to be caught up with him. Hallelujah. Now, don't get this twisted. This is not the period where he's coming to reign. You can read about that in, in Revelation 19 and 20. This is him stopping in the clouds and saying, I'm going to snatch my people up and we're going to go and we're going to have a good time in heaven. Now, If you do your study, it's not just a good time. It's not just the feast. He's also going to judge if you do your study. But I'm not here to talk about that. Okay, but do your study. We're going to get caught up in the clouds. He's taking us into heaven. We're going to have a nice feast. And he's going to say, okay, let's, let's now hold out the accounts of what has been done. Do your study. I'm telling you, don't be sleep. Don't be sleep. You will miss it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is all the reason why we need to be looking up. The apostles, when Jesus ascended into heaven, they were looking up and he left. And the angels like, what y'all looking at? He going to come back the same way. Go get to work. He didn't say it like that. That was just me. But it's just like, yeah, we're looking. And God is saying that's exactly what he wants his people to be doing. You need to be looking. You need to be ready. Be actively looking. He is soon to return. 
If we think that the Israel and Hamas situation is the only one, I'm looking for others to rise up. Because it's wars and rumors of wars. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's about to kick off. You know, we're up in arms about the things that have happened, and it is horrible. And believe me, my heart cries out. I'm, 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 I want to encourage people, show up to those people that are hurting. Show up for them. Because they are hurting. Okay? Israelites, uh, people from Ukraine, people from, they, they are hurting. And what is our job? Show up. Show up compassionately. But don't get caught up in the weeds. Hallelujah. Because there's a goal. What's the song say? You will be our guide to the end, to the end. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Keep watching. Hallelujah. First Corinthians says it's going to be, because some of you might be saying, well, Pastor Corey, when? I'm going to tell you something. I've been hearing this since I've been a, a child. Jesus is coming back. Okay? I, I've been hearing this forever. And the thing is, it's a promise that I will continue to hold on to. Even to the point that I'm in the grave. Because I don't want to lose sight of the promise. Look, the promise is a good promise. That, that I don't have to suffer for my sin. That, 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 that Jesus is, is the Savior. That his blood cleanses me. And he says, I can come and be with him. Because technically, with the life that I've led, I should be burnt up in his presence. But because of Jesus, he said, my blood covers you and you are welcome into the kingdom. And so I'm just like, look, I, I'm down. Let's go. I want this. Because it really comes back to desire. Are you desiring Jesus enough that you're looking for him? I'm a little bit off on my notes here. But look, it's, it's almost just like Song of Solomon. I was thinking about this with Song of Solomon because she was looking for him. And, and she was recalling everything about his body, how his body's all laid out and everything. I know it might be a little bit much for you, but this is what it is in Song of Solomon. It's pretty deep and graphic. It's pretty deep. But she stood outside. She was looking for him. She, was, she, she desired him so much that that was her meditation. She could describe everything about him. And then the flip, he could describe everything about her. There was a longing for their passion. And in the midst of chaos is Jesus our longing. Or are we in a situation where we can describe our circumstances to the T? Because we've been marinating and chewing and, to and turning our circumstances over and over in our head. And we have not surrendered to the Savior to see him above the circumstances. My God. My God. But Pastor Corey, when? 1 Corinthians 15, 52. It says, it will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, when the trumpet sounds, those who, who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. Hallelujah. So we got to be watching. We don't know when. We got to be watching. We don't know when it's going to happen. Jesus talked about this in the parable in Mark 12. Check it out. Mark 12, verse 33 through 37. Mark 12. Verse 33 to 37, it reads, watch out, stay alert, for you do not know when the appointed time is. It is like a man on a journey who, upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay alert. Therefore, stay alert, <laughs> for you do not know when the master of the house is coming whether in the evening, at midnight, or even when the rooster crows, or in the morning, so that he does not come suddenly and find you sleep. What I say to you, I say to all, stay alert. You don't know when he's going to come, okay? But just like in this parable, he's the, he's, the, uh, he's the master who has given instructions to the slaves, to his people that he loves. He says, I want you to do these works until I come. And then when I come back, I should find you doing the works. Uh-oh. I, when I come back, I shouldn't find you sleep on the job. Because there's works that are to be done. 
Are you looking for him? Are you looking for him? Hallelujah. The storms of life, they may come and and try and drift you off course, but our job is to remain. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be steadfast and immovable. Steadfast. I need to be looking. So I can't be pulled by these other things. I need to be stable. What happens with these things is that they try to shake us and shift us. How many, I won't even ask. Many of you this week have been shaken and shifted. This stuff started to come up and it's just like, whoa. But he's saying, be stable, be steadfast, not movable. Not changed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Always abounding. So let's deal with that. This next verse, this is coming from Titus 2, um, and we're going to look at verse 11 and, 11 and 12. Because not only are we to be actively watching, but we're to actively work. There's work that God has called us to. And I want to submit to you that this work is a work that is in us and through us. Okay? In us and through us. Now let's work this. Okay? Here we go. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and in a godly manner in the present age. This is a work. This is an activity that is to be done in you and through you. Hallelujah. While you are waiting, there's work to be done in you and through you. (laughs) Hallelujah. See, this grace that was manifested, this is Jesus. And he is instructing, him, Jesus, is instructing us that there is a process of denying and pursuing. Hello. Denying and pursuing. The work that happens in us is a work of denying and pursuing. I want you to get this because this is significant. Because we do not do enough of this. This work of denying is actually, you can replace the word with renouncing. Hallelujah. We don't hear that word enough. Renouncing. There's, let me tell you what renouncing means. Renouncing, praise God, is to declare one's abandonment of something. So he's telling us that there's a work that Jesus is teaching us to deny all of the worldliness and the ungodly desires. Because part of the problem of us being trapped with the things that are going on in the world and in our personal lives is that we are still wrestling with ungodly desires. We are still wrestling with those ungodly things, the worldly ways within our lives. But Jesus is instructing us that you have to renounce, abandon all that stuff. There were deliverance services that I would remember of they would just tell people, well, start renouncing, start renouncing, renounce, renounce sin, renounce uh, fornication, renounce this. And you go in this process of renouncing. I am abandoning all the old stuff. Hallelujah. You are, if you're dealing with different things that are going on that keep you, th- those weights that are always besetting you, then go on a, 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 go on a trip of abandonment. It, only if you're tired, because if you're not tired, then I don't know why you're renouncing because you're just going to pick it back up again. But if you're tired, renounce the stuff. I'm tired of uh, 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 fornication. I'm tired of uh, 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 pornography. I'm tired of lying. I'm tired of stealing. I'm tired. God, I'm renouncing these things. I'm declaring an abandonment of those things. Because the thing is, you're not going to be able to see him if you are still holding on to these other things. Because these other things are coming up to cloud your vision. It clouds your ability to see straight. When you're wrestling with sin in your life, sometimes you don't even want to hear the truth. The truth could be so simple and so obvious, but because of the sin we got going on in our lives, we can't see it. And all of a sudden, the devil is allowed to beat up on us a little bit more 
to create this space where we are finally saying, okay, I give up. Some of you know what I'm talking about. But we got to be in this space of renouncing. But let me just tell you this. Your job is not only to renounce, but your job is also to pursue. Okay? You, if you spend your time renouncing this, you're going to have a very depressing relationship with Jesus. Oh, my God, I'm renouncing this. And you're always renouncing something. Well, what are you, what are you pursuing? If you're renouncing something, what have you replaced it with? If you're abandoning one activity, what is it being replaced with? And God is calling us to renounce and pursue godliness, pursue righteousness, pursue those things that are are of God. And so this active uh, thing that we're supposed to be in is the activity of pursuing him. I'm renouncing those things that are coming up inside of me. God, I'm abandoning this. I'm abandoning that. But I'm pursuing you. I'm going after those things that are good. I'm going after those things that are kind. I'm going after those things that are true. God, I renounce the lying spirit. God, I renounce the petty spirit. My goodness. I've been dealing with petty all week, and that spirit is so evil and nasty. It is nasty. It intentionally stirs up mess, the spirit of petty. I've had to counsel a couple of people this week, and I told them, I said, look, look, it's petty what's happening. You're operating in the weeds, and what happens when you operate in the weeds is you get choked. Get out of the weeds. Stop dealing with the petty. You ain't got to deal with that petty spirit. Get out of it. Get out of it. Humble yourself before God and watch him work. Because you being wrapped up in all of the petty, it's it's choking you. You can't even exalt God. You can't even cry out. Because you're sitting up there choking on all of this mess. Get out of the mess. I had to do that this week. There's a lot of mess that was going on this week. But glory be to Jesus. When you humble yourself, the word says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So renounce some of those other things. Some of y'all dealing with laziness, okay? Let me just say this. Laziness is a serious trap. Because when, you, when you're lazy, you won't do those things to keep you pursuing. So you come home and it's just like, I'm just too tired. I, I, won't, I won't read today. You know, or the, there's different uh, things that the enemy is trying to do and you see it coming, but you're too lazy to deal with it. Oh yeah, you discern it really well. Devil, I see you. But I'm just too tired to do anything about it. So let me go ahead and fall. Holy Ghost, you're working right now. This laziness demon is something. Thank you. This laziness, thank you. This laziness demon is something. And we need to renounce that. I renounce laziness in Jesus' name. I mean, that's if you you believe in the promise. If you believe in the promise, renounce laziness. And let me pursue godliness. I I think we can end right there. I renounce laziness. I think that was the key right there. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Petty and laziness. My God. I I, I hate petty. I'm I'm telling you, I wanted to fight so bad because this petty was ridiculous. And I thank God for giving me discernment through this because I'm like, this is petty. We're missing the point of Jesus because of petty. You ain't get your way? Are you kidding me? Humble yourself. I had to be nicer than that. But in all seriousness, it's humble yourself. Do you hear what's coming out of your mouth? Your stuff that you got going on, you've made it all about you. And nothing about Jesus. Everything about you. I'm not going to voice my frustration because I'm free. I'm all right. I am. I'm good. The grace of God was with me because people was praying. But I'm telling you, I'm just like, this spirit of petty is out of control. Go to First Peter 1. Praise the Lord. 
First Peter 1 says, hallelujah. Hallelujah. First Peter 1, verse 15, it says, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. The pursuit of that we need to have, even in the midst of ungodliness, is holiness. God's calling us to look like him. Be holy as I am holy. That is the pursuit that we're supposed to have. Let me strive for holiness. Um, Hey, Stephen, can you do me a favor? Go in my office and get my black robe that's in my my closet. Praise the Lord. God, show me this, and I want to just try this experiment. We are to pursue holiness. Holiness, pursuing Christ as he is holy. That means we're set apart as unto God. Look at 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9, we've dealt with this passage before, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Touch your neighbor and say, hey, you're a priest. You're, you're a priest. If you are in here and you're born again, you're a priest. Okay? And so then that means that there is a pursuit, there's an expectation, there's something that God is wanting to do in us to make us qualified as a priest. Hallelujah. When you look at, when, when you think about a priest, some of you may think of the white collar You may think of, you know, the long black robe, praise the Lord, they're going to get my long black robe. Because we we associate the fact that if you are wearing the long black robe, then there's no way that you should be cussing. If you are wearing the long black robe, then then there is no reason, it's in my closet, in, in my office, praise the Lord. In my office, it's in the closet, yep. My makeshift closet, because I don't have a real closet. (laughs) Amen. Praise the Lord. But if you are wearing the long black robe, you're not going to find him in the strip club with the ball of dollar bills. You know what I'm saying? You'd have an issue if the long black robe was in the strip club. Do you hear what I'm saying? So there's a behavior that is to be pursued. Praise the Lord. Terry, come in. Bless the name of Jesus. Terry, yeah, you come in. Hallelujah. Now, here's the thing, and you are already wearing something nice. I love that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I want you to notice something, and, 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 and this would be a job that I would give each one of you, hallelujah, that you have my robe for the day. Okay? You're not to take it off. You, you have my robe for the day. Now, my question to you, how is that going to change your behavior? You can't take it off. You have it for the day. So he's calling me. He's doing a work, an active work inside of me. So I really don't got time for all the other stuff that's going on. I can be compassionate and I can respond compassionately. But ultimately, God has called me to be a holy vessel set aside for him. I'm not set aside for the wars and the rumors of wars. I'm set aside for the promise because the promise is for his holy children. So I need to be working towards pursuing the things that are holy. Each one of you after service will get a robe today. No, I'm kidding. But it doesn't require a robe. It does not require a robe. Because even some of y'all have had experiences with people that have worn the robe that have dishonored the robe. So it's not about the clothes. But it's about us being obedient to the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is resting on us. So even when you go step out to the club, to the strip club, the Spirit of God is like, I am with you in this mess, and you need to get out of here. Oh, I remember that. Not the strip club, but I remember being in the club, and the Spirit was just like, you don't belong here. Get up out. I remember. There were times that I wasn't listening to the Spirit, and I was very comfortable. I was on the speaker. 
and I was very comfortable. But the more that I was pursuing Christ, the more the Holy Spirit was speaking and saying, this is not the environment for you because I'm teaching you. I'm teaching you and readying you to be with me. Holiness. Denying all the other things and pursuing him. Thank you, sir. You don't have to take the road. It's mine anyway. It, it belongs to me. Thank you. Praise the Lord. So there's a pursuit that we have to have. We have to make sure that we are walking in the way of Christ, not denying all those other things and pursuing him. The scriptures told us is that we have to live sensibly. And sensibly is in a way that shows wisdom or prudence. When you look at somebody that might be in that robe, in the midst of chaos, I'm going to go to that robe. In the midst of something that's going down, I need to get some wisdom about what's happening. What, what, are we, what are we to do? Let me go to the one that has the wisdom. People at your job are wanting to go to you because of how you have stood, of how you have stood as a, as a man or a woman of God. They're wanting to come to you. How are we supposed to respond to this? You are supposed to live sensibly. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say, live sensibly. My God, hallelujah. 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 So we have an active posture of, 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 of a work that needs to be done in us, and now let's deal with the through us. Hallelujah. Verse uh, Titus 2, verse 14. Go there. Hallelujah. We're talking about Jesus who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify himself a people for his own possession. So you can see all of that. He wants to, he wants to help us get rid of the lawlessness. He wants to buy us back from that. And then he wants to purify us, make us holy. That's the work to be done in us. But now look at this next part. He says, eager for good deeds. Hallelujah. In other words, I'm eager to do what's right. I'm eager to carry out the will of God. Hallelujah. Eager to do those things. So another active posture for us is to be eager to do good. Our pursuit should be to love the Lord our God and to love people. Hallelujah. There's this L thing we got going on. Hallelujah. He's doing work in me here, and then he's working through us for out there. There's good works that he has prepared for us to do. When Jesus returns, he needs to find us working. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Matthew 5, 16. You all know this passage very much so. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Can I tell you that when all the stuff started happening in the world, when, when the Hamas and, and was bombing Israel, the, the good things that God is stirring up inside of you should have been, let me call my friend who's a Jew and let me show up. Let me call my friend who's a Palestinian and let me show up. Oh, did I, did I say something bad? No, because God is a compassionate God. And so the good works is for us to show up. The, uh, the, the job that we have to do is to point people to God. In the midst of chaos, your job is to point people to God. Hallelujah. Actively waiting, I'm waiting. He is going to be my guide to the end. And while I'm watching, while I'm waiting, I'm also working. The assignment of the master, he's given us the assignment to do the work. So show up. Show up for the hurting. Show up for the broken. Show up for those that are going through. Because you are the one that has God. That's how you're supposed to be acting. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are the one that has God. Next scripture, 1 Peter 2, verse 11 through 12. Nope, I got that wrong, I think. Nope, I got it right. 1 Peter 2, verse 11 through 12. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Hallelujah. 
We need to be acting in the way of God. We need to be acting and giving the the good works that he has called us to do. And check what the verse said. Your temporary residence. If I put my stake in this world, then when everything is going wrong in the world, I'm going to be complaining about the world. But because I'm a temporary residence, I know that this is not my home. Some of us are, some of us have like, well, I got all of this stuff going on going on. I got, no, I've got, I got plans and trips and different things. I'm sorry, but the thing is, your plans and your trips are going to go sour. You're like, that's not very encouraging. Look, I, we need to look beyond this stuff in this world. It's a temporary place. He has called me to a better place. I'm holding on to that promise. So I need to be acting and doing the work while I am here. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 10, verse 23 to 24. You've heard us say this scripture many times. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. So all of us in here, we need, we need to be stimulating one another to love and good deeds. Even though there's a whole bunch of stuff going on, it's just like, hey, let's continue to show up. Let's get, what else can we do? What else can we do for the people that are hurting? What else can we do for the people that are broken? Hallelujah. Because we know the mercy that God has given us, so therefore I cannot help but give it back out. I know what he's done. I know how he's blessed me. So I cannot help but want to reciprocate that to other people. Hallelujah. And I'm closing. People will ask, how is it that you are still able to remain positive and still show up for the lost and the broken? What is it that drives you to show up and, and show love to those that are in need? I'm constantly, actively waiting. I'm in a posture for watching. I'm, an, I'm in a posture for being active. Daily living, renouncing and pursuing. Hallelujah. And, and doing the good deeds that God has called me to. Hallelujah. As the world turns, as earthquakes erupt, you know, brutal wars happen and, and, and life even sucker punches you. We got to stand. We got to stand and be watchful. I, and the, the many things that have happened to me this week, um, it, God has had to give me wisdom through this stuff. It's been tough. To, to, to be able to show up in a compassionate way, to be able to show up and give wisdom in the midst of chaos. You really got to know who you are. You really got to know who you belong to. Because people are looking for answers. Apostle Harry would always say, keep the main thing, the main thing. The main thing is Jesus and his return. He has made a promise, and he is faithful. Practically, what does this look like for today? First of all, run. When things are going in chaos, run to God. Run to him and operatively humble yourself in his presence. Secondly, seek. Seek his word. When stuff started going crazy, that's the first place I went. I didn't go to CNN. Didn't go to ABC. I'm like, God, what's happening? Help me to discern well. I got to seek his word. Thirdly, I got to live. I got to live out the priestly call he's called us to. It's not just me. Somebody say, it's not just you, Pastor Corey. You hear what I'm saying? It, it's, it's all of us. All of us are called to live out this priestly call. That scripture that said, 1 Peter 2, 9, it's, it's not that those that are pastors are the anointed priesthood. It says, you are my people, the anointed priesthood. So that all of us need to be living out the priesthood. Showing up at your job, being the representative of God. Showing up in your school, being representative of God. And can I even say this even personally? Because the thing is, sometimes behind closed doors, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in our homes, but we need to show up as priests even in our homes. Yeah. 
showing up as priest, living in a priestly way. Number five, demonstrate. Demonstrate your love for God by continuing the mission. Demonstrate it. Let people see. Demonstrate his love. If there's opportunities for you to join a food pantry or something like that or, or you know, help people that are going through the war, um, you know what has blessed me so much? is I, I'm, it's, it's a sacrifice for me every Wednesday to drive up to Kenosha to do a lot's dance in Kenosha at this one school that I'm at. There are 15 kids, and what has been touching my heart is that there is a refugee from Ukraine who ended up here in Kenosha, and she's attending the school, and she's attending a lot's dance. And I'm like, wow. I get the honor and the privilege of being a light to this little girl. And, and, and she, everything is amazing to her. She's awed by everything. So she's still learning English, but she's awed by everything. And it just, it blesses me to be a blessing to her. I have to demonstrate. Lastly, I need to listen. I need to listen for his voice when he calls. It may not be the trumpet call, but there's other calls that he's making while I'm waiting. Praise the Lord. These last two scriptures have been a very much a big influence in my life. Here's the first one. As stuff was going down, this is Psalm 46.10. As stuff was going down, the word that kept coming to me was be still. Be still. And what's the second part? And know that I am God. In the midst of this chaos that's in the world, in the midst of the stuff that's going on in your personal lives, I want to encourage you. Be still and know that he is God. With the worship that we had today, this worship was so resonating because it was declaring my position in God. Be still and know that I am God. This next scripture has also been a big encouragement. 1 Peter 5, verse 6 and 8. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. And check this out. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Let's bow our heads. Some of us have been in this position of being devoured almost to the point of feeling like we are sinking because there's just been so much mess going on. Some of us are in the midst of storms that have really taken our joy away. It's been hard to lift your head. It's been hard to, to even connect with God, even in your personal times, because the storms have been so overwhelming. And I want to encourage you today that God is faithful to his promise. You might be here today and, and, and you are looking for hope. You're looking for who is the Savior that you are referring to. And I want to offer that salvation to you today, that Jesus is here. And he will love you right where you are and accept you as that child. And he will begin to teach you what it is to deny and pursue. His name is Jesus. When we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, He cancels every judgment against us. He cancels all of the sin. And He says, I'm covering you with my blood. So now I'm not seeing you as an enemy, but now I'm seeing you as a son. In these last days, it's critical for us to herald Jesus is coming. Maybe you're that person that's not ready and you want Jesus. If you want Jesus, I want you to raise your hand. We'll pray with you. 
I'm not born again, but I, I, I hear the message of the gospel and I want to receive Jesus as my Savior. Okay. Praise the Lord. For the rest of us, these storms have been so much. And, and if, if you're a person that is just going through and, and it's been hard to even discern what to do, I want to pray for you. And so I just want you to stand where you are. Just the storms have just been raging up and it's really started to wrestle with you. It's been hard. Yeah, I know there's more, so I'm, I'll wait. Hallelujah. Sometimes this weight has been so heavy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, as, I, as these people are standing before your presence, Lord God, Father, they, there are things that they have been carrying that have been so heavy, Lord God, and it's been hard to see. It's been hard to, to be able to walk. And so, Father, I'm praying right now, Lord God, that they would release those things unto you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray, Lord God, that their faith would be stirred up in the name of Jesus. Father, to see you as the God who called them out of darkness, to see you as the God who accepted them right where they are, to see you as the God who has been faithful since the beginning. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that their faith would arise, oh God, that they would begin to cast their cares before you, oh God. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that they would humble themselves before you. Father, they, that, that they would recognize that, that even their holding on to the, to the issues is a form of arrogance in your presence. Father, I pray, Lord God, that we would let go of those things. Father, I pray right now, Lord God, for those that are wrestling with you, Father, that they would surrender to you right now in Jesus' name. Father, you are a God who is faithful. You have our best interests in mind because we belong to you. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would encourage them in their heart to know that you have everything under control. Father, I pray, Lord God, that there would be a, a renouncing of even the fear, a renouncing of the doubt. We're totally abandoning the doubt right now. We're totally abandoning the fear right now. And we're replacing it with complete trust in you, our God. Complete trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, we thank you, Lord God. I want everybody to stretch out their hands unto the Lord as, we, as I pray this last prayer. Father, I ask, Lord God, that you would help us, Lord God, to discern well in these uncertain times. Father, these are times, Lord God, that are, that are showing a lot of aggression. These are times that are showing a lot of uncertainty. But Father, I pray right now, Lord God, that we would commit our way to you. Father, help us, Lord God, to have a, 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 a posture of watching and waiting, oh God. Watching and working in your vineyard, oh God. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that we would look to you, our Savior and our God. May our eyes be set on you. Help us to be sober. Help us to be alert. Help us to be fervent. Help us to be steadfast. Help us to be immovable. Help us to be abounding in the work. Father, I come against every distraction that, is, that, that the enemy has planned for this week. Father, I pray for the authority of your spirit to arise up in your people in the name of Jesus. I pray that the Holy Ghost would arise from the very loins of our body and begin to proclaim that the truth is the truth. Father, I pray that we will stand in the face of every single trial, trusting in the Lord 
our God. We thank you, Lord God, that you are faithful. May our hearts be set on our Savior who is soon to come. We give you all the honor. All the glory belongs to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, and let every heart say, Amen and Amen. Come on and bless the Lord. Come on and bless him.